Today I want to talk about Shadow Blade and how I beat Insane Roguelike difficulty with it, although it got pretty close at times. As always, in the first part of the video I'll go over all the Shadow Blade talents, and the second one I'll show you the character that I beat the game with and talk you through leveling, prodigies, gear, and so on. Shadow Blade is one of the default classes in the base game, and it's a rogue, a dual wielding weapon class that is also touched by the gift of magic, so it gets some extra tricks up its sleeve, which for example allow it to reach some of the highest action speed in Tome. Let's get into the talents, starting with dual techniques. The stun talent for dual wielding is dual strike, and even at 1.0 mastery you can eventually keep an enemy stunt permanently, which is great, but what you really should be focusing on here is that this and a few other later talents we'll see apply through accuracy, not physical power, which is important since the most obvious way to build Shadow Blade is to dual wield daggers, which scale through dexterity and cunning. So this lets you invest into those stats while still being able to easily apply your debuffs. Physical power is still important since it raises your weapon damage, you can read about it more on the wiki, but this is definitely a positive. Flurry is the jewel of dual wielding talents, allowing you to hit six times in a single action, which works extremely well with on-hit effects and generally does a ton of damage. Investing points here though is a luxury, because it only improves the damage which already scales as your weapons get stronger. Heartseeker is a decent attack tied to mobility, which makes this into an amazing talent. Getting at least 3 points here for the range feels really good and you'll get a lot of use out of this to catch up with all the annoying ranged enemies. Whirlwind is the AoE of Shadowblade and it only deals close to a regular attack's worth of damage, the bleed takes a while, so it's just okay. It's again more useful for its mobility, although here you can only get it up to 3 range. Moving on to Duelist, I'm honestly not quite sure what to think about Dual Weapon Mastery. It reduces your offhand damage penalty, which is nice, but then it also gives you the ability to parry weapon attacks, which reduces the damage before multipliers, similar to armor, and even prevents critical strikes. The number of damage you parry never gets very high, I only reached 30-ish in the late game on my character, so it doesn't feel very impactful, but the more I think about it, the better I think it is. Even if it didn't block any damage, just the ability to not get critically hit seems very good, so this definitely deserves some points. Tempo passively gives you a bit of stamina on offhand crits, parries and dodges, and even some speed, sometimes. This is okay, but I don't think it needs more than a single point. Faint swaps you with an enemy in melee range and improves your parry chance. I found that you usually don't want to spend a turn on this, I only very rarely use this to either get out of being surrounded or to pin an enemy before running away with a movement infusion, so it's alright, but a one pointer. Lunge is a solid offhand attack that disarms your enemy for a long time and this arm makes any melee enemy that is not called brawler basically useless. In those scenarios it's better than stun even, because you can't use weapon talents while you are disarmed, so this is deserving of at least 2 points for the disarm duration. Stealth is interesting, as it makes enemies sometimes act as if they were under effects of confusion, but it's quite unreliable. Apparently it works better when you fully invest and commit into it, but there's no need for that for Shadow Blade, especially since you don't actually want to be in stealth, you want to have recently left stealth, as you'll see in a bit. Shadow Strike gives you crits when enemies don't see you coming, which for the most part won't work, but it then passively gives you crit multi after you leave stealth, so it's nice to get this to the fourth in duration eventually. Soothing Darkness gives you life and stamina region in stealth, and then multiplies it by 5 after leaving stealth. The numbers are pretty low, so it will never be crazy high, but the stamina region is very useful and in the ambush tree you get a talent that improves soothing darkness, making it also give 25% all resist on leaving stealth, so you want to get this to the 4 turn threshold. Shadow Dance is what you press when soothing darkness is about to fall off in 2 turns, so that you can get it right back. 
putting points here actually makes it worse since you won't be able to leave stealth for longer. If you think you can instead use this to maybe lose enemies when you break line of sight, eh, you should still just leave the zone to reset aggro for that. Dirty fighting, the tree, is all about debuffs and the talent reduces enemy immunities, mainly relevant for stun, but I use this like 4 times maybe, because some of the enemies that have stun immunity will even have like 160% stun immunity, at least on insane, so I definitely wouldn't miss this talent. But it lets you get to backstep, which really performs on Shadow Blade. Your opener talents stun, disarm or silence, so you can stack up the damage pretty quickly and maybe even apply the cripple when you flurry. I think this is worth maxing if you find the points for it. Blinding Powder blinds in a small cone, basically melee range. I like blind as a debuff, but not in this scenario. If I'm in melee, I'd rather use the disarm or stun and then flurry and then the enemy is dead or almost dead, so I want to keep doing damage instead of just blinding them so I don't think there's much space in the talent rotation for this talent. Twist the knife is then in a similar boat, although I could be wrong here, as it seems like a really good talent. It lets you prolong debuffs, but Shadowblade can usually apply them constantly, I didn't find the need for it, and then it can reduce buffs, which again I'd rather stun and then flurry. The one buff that made me try this talent out was evasion, which enemy rogues will use and dodge like 40% of your attacks, which is annoying, but you can just wait it out. I don't think this is worth any points. Shadow Magic is one of the unique Shadow Blade trees, and you get Shadow Combat, which is a sustain that gives you darkness damage on hit. It scales with spell power, but most Shadow Blade builds won't have much spell power. You'll just put enough points into magic to unlock your talents, so this is alright for a point or two, but nothing special. Shadow Cunning gives you spell power for cunning. Cool for one point, but it doesn't scale too well. Shadow Feed is a sustain that gives you attack speed, which I like, and it gives you mana regen, which is good, because unlike mages, Shadow Blade does not naturally regenerate mana, so this lets you ditch the mana search rune if you felt like you need it. Great, very uh, maxable talent. Shadow Step lets you teleport from up to 11 range to hit an enemy and also daze them. The key here is teleport. This enables out of phase, which is a stat you can stack on your gear that can give you tons of all resist and defense, up to 40%. Once you have that, this is the perfect gap closer, so you'll want to put some points here for the extra range. Early game, it's nothing special though. The other unlocked magic tree is Phantasm. Illuminate does big AoE light damage and blinds, so it's a decent spell, but wrong damage type, and you'll fail the blind with low spell power. Phantasmal Shield is a talent where I just now realized I completely misunderstood how it works. It gives you a small chance to ignore damage, which apparently does not have a cooldown, which I thought it did. Then if that doesn't trigger, you dazzle them and hit them with light damage, which does have a cooldown. Maybe this is obvious to you, but I had a mini mind expansion moment, because when playing I noticed the damage triggers way too often for 10%, so I felt something is off, and turns out it's my inability to read again. I already thought this talent is good, but now that I know the damage ignore has no cooldown, I like it even more. I would say put more points into it, but without spell power it doesn't scale too well, so not a priority. Invisibility makes you invisible and increases your invisibility power, which is not the same as stealth power, as far as I understand. So there's no synergy here, I think this is pretty much useless. Mirror image summons a copy of you that can taunt if you don't cast spells or copy them if you do. I feel like this is more of a archmage talent, maybe I'm underestimating it and you can use it to copy like shadow step? but I'd rather save the points and put them somewhere else. In the locked trees there is the common combat techniques. Rush is a great gap closer. Precise strikes lowers your attack speed for accuracy and crit, which is usually not worth it. Perfect strike gives you a big burst of accuracy, which can be situationally very useful. 
and blinding speed is the reason you should consider unlocking this tree, because it gives you global speed at instant speed, which is very good. Combat Veteran has passives that give a tiny bit of stamina and life regen, and it's pretty much never worth investing into, and it's definitely not worth unlocking. Ambush is the second unique Shadow Blade tree, Shadow Guard is the excellent Soothing Darkness augment, and the second effect is alright, but this doesn't need more than a single point. Shadow Grasp is your initiator before you get the out of phase stat on your gear and remains great after that. This absolutely ruins casters and weapon classes alike and applies through accuracy, so it's just perfect to give you enough time to unleash your big attacks. It also is range 10 from the first point invested, so it's incredible and cheap since you don't care about the damage. Umbral Agility passively gives you accuracy and defense, which is good, and Darkness Penetration, which is useful for Shadow Step, I guess, but not important. Great for a point, more won't give much with low spell power. And Shadow Veil, vale, the big finisher talent, which unfortunately I think just reduces your chance of beating the game anytime you press it. I am not willing to lose control of my character for 3 turns for basically any effect. It's simply too much of a risk. Getting all your resists to 70% and being immune to debuffs does not mean you are safe. Now, there are characters in the vault that have beaten the game on Insane Rook-like and have 5 points in Shadow Veil. So I assume they used it, so it can work, but since there are plenty of other good attacks on Shadow Blade, I don't see a reason to put points into this. Temporal is the last locked class category, and it's a problem, because it's the third good locked category, so if you want 5 inscriptions, you can't unlock all of them. Congeal Time is a projectile that applies a big slow. You likely won't have the spell power to apply this, and even if you did, You'd rather just either use the grab or shadow step and then flurry, so I don't think Shadow Blade needs this. Temporal Shield though is useful on any character. It's an instant speed shield, which also then heals you over time when it goes away. It's simply excellent. It won't get as big as on Archmage, but I still value this very highly. It's basically like a free inscription. Definitely worth investing into. Time Prison is a great tool that lets you completely disable an enemy for a long time while you refresh your cooldowns, since you can't damage it. But again, without enough spell power, this is useless, so likely not worth it. Essence of Speed is a sustain that gives you global speed. The only downside is that it costs 120 mana to sustain, which is a lot, and you won't have the mana for it in the early game since you don't take willpower. But later on you can sustain it without problems, and you should. Worth 5 points if you take this category. On the generic side there is mobility, with some of the best defensive talents. Disengage does exactly what it's called, although it takes a turn and needs to be used in a line, and the increased movement speed is not that much, but still it's a good talent to have and I like 2 points for 5 range. Evasion is what you click against any tough looking weapon user enemy and become super tanky. I very rarely use this talent for the stupid reason that it costs a decent amount of stamina, which can be a problem early game, but it's good and doesn't need many points, so use it. Tumble is the god talent. Now that I've played two rogues in a row, I don't know if I can play without this. It's an instant speed movement talent that is so so useful, because you can not only use it defensively, but also offensively. You can spot an enemy with track, pre-buff, tumble around the corner and unleash your attacks, which all happens instantly, unlike if you were to just walk around the corner, where the enemy has some time to react. This is especially good once you have out of phase, so that you get to trigger all that sweet sweet all resist with shadow step before the enemies have time to damage you. It even has a pretty short cooldown, so it will be back up if you need it to run away. Definitely immediately worth at least 2 points for the range. Trained Reactions is a sustain that reduces damage from big hits, but it costs stamina to do so. Extremely good once you can run it without it destroying your stamina bar. Early on you can still run it, 
but only put one or two points into it, so it doesn't regress often. As a general rule, around the first prodigy I like to max it. On to lethality, it passively gives you crit chance and crit multi, and makes your daggers or knives use cunning instead of strength. Unless you are really desperate though, I wouldn't max this. It doesn't scale well, two points seem like a good breakpoint. Expose weakness is what helps you get through the hardest to kill type of enemy for rogue, high armor, full resist meatballs, as it gives you a huge boost to armor pen, accuracy and all damage penetration. Very useful and again worth two-ish points. Blade Flurry is a sustain that increases your attack speed and makes your attacks cleave for the price of constantly draining 4 stamina per turn. So I only ended up using this at the very end of my run, in the last Orc Pride and throughout High Peak, and I regret it because this talent is pretty nuts. I for some reason assumed this stamina drain increases over time, because that's how a lot of these talents work in this game, but this one doesn't, and you can easily counteract this stamina drain with Soothing Darkness, so it's more or less free to run, and speed is good. The extra AoE also doesn't hurt, and maybe the most important part of this talent, it really increases the cool factor, because the sustain has a small visual effect, and you simply just annihilate enemies a lot faster with this on. Definitely worth maxing. Snap resets your cooldowns. I like this at two points, which makes it always target flurry, which is the most important and definitely worth the extra turn. In the common survival, you always want track to see uniques before they see you, and device mastery can be good to use your active items more often. Conveyance is another stolen archmage category. Face door is an excellent mobility talent, but is expensive. It needs 5 points with 1.0 mastery so that you can actually target it. Since Shadowblade already has a lot of other good mobility talents, I think this is mostly useful to have in the reserves as an extra out of phase activator later in the game. Teleport is another decent mobility talent, but this one is definitely too expensive for Shadowblade. At the most I would put a single point here, so that you can randomly teleport somewhere if you run out of all other options. Displacement shield is a good shield, but without a lot of spell power I don't think it's worth it. And probability travel lets you warp through walls, and it's an extremely situational talent that you don't have the spare points for. Divination is a decent locked category, which I don't think you'll ever be unlocking, since there are better options. Arcane Eye is pretty useful, but it's kind of like track, which Shadowblade already has. Keen Senses is a tiny bit of crit chance for spells, not good for this class. Vision shows the layout of the level, which is pretty useless for the most part, and Premonition is a very good sustain, as it gives you a specific resistance before that damage type hits you, but you don't need the Divination Tree for this, as Premonition is an escort reward from Sears, so you can usually pick it up that way if you really want it. Welcome to this new puzzle segment, which is probably unlikely to repeat, but this was a very intense, important decision that I had to make, and I thought it's pretty interesting. So let me give you all the important context, so that you can decide how you are going to survive. I am in War Pride, which is the Mage Pride, and I am in a bit of a predicament. I currently have negative 36 life, and I think I die at like negative 200 life, so it's not looking too good. In terms of the information about enemies, I have cleared out the initial room, and basically all the information about enemies that I have, you can see. There is a rogue brawler boss enemy standing next to me, which I very stupidly let stand next to me for about two turns, where I just did not react. And then there are a bunch of regular enemies staring at me, and the rest is darkness. There could be enemies above, below, to the left, it is definitely a danger to try and leave this starting room, although maybe the only option to survive. Next important point is that I cannot leave the level for three more turns, since I killed an enemy, 
and on insane I think it takes 5 turns before you can leave a level after you kill an enemy, so I need 3 more turns without another kill to leave and reach safety. When you look at my skill bar, the really crucial part is that the temporal shield is a single turn from coming back up, which will give me 400, 500 life, which should be enough to stabilize me since I'm also getting a decent amount of life regen, and then there is Storm Shield in 3 turns, and a Healing Infusion in 4 turns, and once I reach that I'm fine. So the question is, very simply, what is my next action? If you answered face door the boss out of the room to create some distance, and then tumble at the entrance to the level and wait 3 turns, you are correct! Congratulations! Well, at least that's what I did, and I survived. Obviously I can't guarantee that a different play wouldn't work, but I think this makes the most sense. Obviously I need to create distance between myself and the rogue brawler. That is absolutely priority number one. I considered trying to leave the room, to like tumble uh, or shadow step outside the initial room, but that is so risky, there could be more enemies, and what am I even going to do then? I will have to fight them, but not go too far, because if I trigger more enemies, I'm probably dead. So I don't think leaving the starting room is possible. And then I considered face dooring myself to just create some distance and hope that I survive that extra turn to get my temporal shield back. And ultimately, that version of that play, of teleporting myself, is just an inferior version of teleporting the boss as far away from me as possible. So that's how I came to this conclusion and I pressed the buttons, closed my eyes because I didn't want to see my screen freezing for a second before the you died menu appears, but it didn't and I'm now able to make this video about Shadowblade, so that's it for the puzzle. So here's my guy, straight from the final boss. These are the add-ons that I use, none of them affect gameplay and if you are new to the game I would recommend just ignoring this, play vanilla and pick up these add-ons when you find the need for them. So there is a lot to talk about and we're kind of going to be talking about it all at once because it's all interconnected. First let's get the race choice out of the way. In my eyes I saw two attractive options and the first one was Kornak because you want combat techniques for the blinding speed, you want temporal for essence of speed and temporal shield and you also want ambush for all these three talents and then you also want five inscriptions. You don't need five inscriptions but I try to get to that on all of my characters. So obviously if I want to do all of that I need to go Kornak, there's no other option. But if you go Shalor you get Grace of the Eternals which is basically blinding speed, even a little better. Uh, these two do not stack, you can't use both of them. And I lose out on Rush, which is not that important. This class has a lot of other mobility talents. And Perfect Strike is nice, but again, not something you really need. And again, Magic of the Eternals, which is better than Lethality. So you can just put the points here for the crit and crit multi. And obviously you get Timeless, which is one of the best talents in the game. So Shalor ended up feeling like the obvious choice. Or if you are willing to go down to 4 inscriptions, I'm sure Drem would be great just to reset Flurry, or you could go Halfling or any of the other decent races that can always be picked. But if you want 5 inscriptions, I think it's Shalor. Then also one race that I've seen mentioned in some of the outdated guides is Ogre, because then you can use a two-handed weapon in your main hand and I guess a dagger in the offhand, which is supposed to do more damage, I guess, but then this is expensive on the generic points because you will need weapon mastery for the main hand and it just seems needlessly complicated. Shadowblade doesn't struggle with damage and personally I don't really like playing Ogre because of the 20% penalty to a bunch of stats, which is pretty impactful, especially early game. So just save yourself a lot of headaches and dual wield the daggers. You'll do plenty of damage, trust me. But now we get to the stats. And the first two are easy. You go dexterity and cunning. Just spread evenly because your daggers scale 50% cunning 
50% dexterity. So it just purely depends on what you need for your talents. I guess accuracy is marginally better because it gives accuracy and defense, whereas the crit is not needed early on, but you max these two first. And then it's about the third stat. And I ended up maxing strength for the physical power, which gives me a small but still some increase to my attacks. And for my prodigies I took ethereal form first, just to feel more comfortable in melee. It's hard to resist this prodigy on any squishy melee character. And then for the second prodigy I was looking for an offensive prodigy, and I ended up picking flexible combat, which is just always good. If you have flurry on your character, you can pick flexible combat, it's going to be good. You're going to eventually find some decent gloves that have a proc that gives you an extra attack. Ideally, you will have Ducktoon's Gauntlets, which have great basic stats with a huge crit multi, and you get 15% wave of power on hit, which basically just reads make an extra attack 15% of the time. That's pretty good. Or so I thought, because with this way of building the character, I am missing these 30 points in magic. So 30 raw spell power, which hurts talents like Umbral Agility and Temporal Shield and Shadow Combat a little bit, I guess. I figured this was a worthy trade-off, but what I honestly completely forgot about is that Arcane Might increases your raw physical power by 100% of your raw spell power, and you get 1 point of physical power for strength and 1 point of spell power for magic. This means I would literally get the same amount of physical power if I just put these 30 points into magic, but I would also gain that 30 spell power. The crit chance is not really relevant because you'll get to 100% anyways, especially with talents like Lethality or Magic of the Eternals. So then the question is, how much worse is getting a 50% magic modifier on the daggers versus flexible combat? And honestly, I'm not entirely sure. So. Arcane Might is definitely a very viable option. You could also obviously take both of them, if you think you don't need the extra defense from Ethereal form. Or if you go for this Strength Focus build, you could go Pain Enhancement System instead of Flexible Combat, which would give me 51 to all stats other than Strength whenever I crit, which is always. And if you compare it with Arcane Might, this gives you 50% Magic modifier, but this gives you 50 more decks, 50 more cunning, and it gives you some extra spell power through magic, which improves some of these passive talents. So I think this is an interesting option. So these four prodigies I see as the obvious one for this class, and you can pick any combination of them depending on your stats and what you think you need. With all that being said, I will stick to this version of the character, where you put the extra points into strength and the leftover points into magic. If you want to do the Arcane Might version, you basically just take like a 1 point from Flurry and maybe put it into Umbral Agility, and you max magic obviously before strength, and other than that, the rest of the tree is basically the same, so you can choose whichever sounds better to you. Alright, so now that that is out of the way, we can talk about the leveling, and Shadowblade is a weird class, because usually what happens is that around like level 45 to 50, you put all these last class points into talents where it's not necessarily needed to make them good, but you have nowhere else to put the points, so you just improve some of your attacks maybe, stuff like that. But on Shadowblade, this happens on like level 15 or 20, like really early, because the only talents you really want maxed is Shadow Feet and eventually Essence of Speed, and everything else is kind of preference depending on what you feel your character needs right now. I think it makes the most sense to invest into the weapon talents to increase the debuff duration, so the disarm and the stun, and then getting the extra range on Heartseeker is quite important. And then you want 4 points in Shadow Step for the 10 range once you have out of phase on your gear. And a lot of these small decisions like I put an extra point into Shadow Combat for the 9 extra on hit damage, I put 4 points into Flurry, where you know, it could have 2 or 3 and be just fine. So you could maybe take these points and put them into Whirlwind, not Whirlwind, uh, Heartseeker, so that you get it to 6 range. Maybe you don't have to max Temporal Shield, since the last point gives you 39 shield, 
Maybe you put it into Phantasm for the 1% extra damage ignore. Or maybe the last point into Dual Weapon Mastery for the slightly higher parry chance. Yeah, you, you see that it really doesn't matter much. These are extremely minor differences that won't make or break your character. On the generic point side, I feel like this is pretty much perfect. I would maybe take one point from Disengage and put the last point into Blade Flurry, which I couldn't max at the end because I just didn't have enough points left over. One point in Heavy Armor Training, as always, so that you can use Gauntlets, Helms and Heavy Boots. In Accuracy I only ended up with two points because, you know, sometimes I end up maxing this if there are no good uses for the generic points, but if there are, getting 11 Accuracy is not all that much, especially since you can get the same amount of Accuracy by putting points into Exposed Weakness. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the talents. Expect to struggle around the tier 2 dungeons. This is one of those classes where it is extremely, extremely likely you will run into enemies that you just can't kill, even in multiple dungeons. So you either have to kite them away from the entrance and then try to avoid them, or go to a different dungeon and come back later. You have the tools for this, with a lot of speed, and you disarm so you can swap places with them so you can manipulate them and then tumble over them and movement infusion out of the level to then come back with their aggro reset and then you don't aggro them and clear the last of the level. You might have to do that and that part of the game is a little painful. But then you slowly ramp up into the late game where with the out of phase buff you reach 70% in all resistances. I can demonstrate that for you real quick. So. You just use Shadow Step, boom. I didn't teleport because I think I'm standing in the entrance. I guess you can't teleport in the experimentation room. Uh, so I'm not going to show you, but yeah. With all the resist, you'll be quite tanky and deal a ton of damage. For the inscriptions, I changed my default setup a little bit. I still have a movement, of course, a wild for mental and physical, which really could have been a Shatter Afflictions, since silence is not too big of a deal and I will never need this all resistance. And that's what Wild does when it says it reduces all damage. In reality it gives all resistance, which I will never need. So maybe you could run a Shatter Afflictions here, then a healing for some extra HP and a cleanse, a dissipation to get rid of all the nasty sustains on all the mages, and a rune storm shield, which I usually stay away from because it doesn't cleanse any debuffs. In terms of protecting you from damage, it is the best inscription you can find, if it is a good storm shield. Obviously if the threshold is damage over 10, that's not great. Even this 35 is on the low side, but I couldn't find anything better, and I just felt a little squishy, so I thought a storm shield would be decent. It is definitely the best inscription psychologically, because when you click on this, and then you fight for a bit, you know, do some actions, and then you hover to the right side and you see you still have Storm Shield up, you feel invincible. Because, well, you are basically invincible, you can't take a lot of damage. So Storm Shield is always a good option if you want to be more tanky, although I usually prefer debuff cleanses. Here I think it made a lot of sense. As for the items, you are looking for all the usual stuff. So crit multi, increased physical, get your pen to 70%. You can ignore powers for the most part, that's nice, but you want to focus on accuracy, which 88 is pretty miserable. You want to get this to around 100, ideally a little over 100, but I couldn't really find any good gear or craft it, and you can use Expose Weakness as a bit of a crutch, because when I hit a dummy with Expose Weakness, I get 97 accuracy, which is where Ideally, you would have the default accuracy, and then with Exposed Weakness you would jump to above 800, but it's good enough, okay? And then if you can pick up some on-hit damage, it's always much better if you have Flurry, which obviously Shadowblade does. And defensively, you are looking for the out of phase stat. And I'm using an add-on that changes the descriptions a little bit, but hopefully it should still be readable. Here the out of phase stat is the defense slash teleport, Resistance slash teleport and duration slash teleport. So that's the one you want. It caps out at 40%, so you don't need more than that. So that's the general overview. Oh yeah, and one point I forgot to mention is infravision. Because when you are in stealth, 
your light radius goes negative 1000. So you won't be able to see your surroundings. So if you can pick up some infravision, which is heightened senses, infravision, that's the same stat. This will still let you see creatures, even in stealth. So that is pretty useful. You obviously have track, so you don't really need it, need it, but it feels better to play when you can actually see what's going on before you leave stealth. On my neck, I ended up using this amulet that just gives some crit multi, fist crit, some stats. But what I liked the most is it increases the resistance cap by 4%. And since I have out of phase, I have a very easy time reaching that. On your cloak is where you can more easily get the out of phase stat through the void stalkers. Ego, I think it's called. Your gloves, I already mentioned. Ideally, you get Dactoon's gauntlets. If you can't find them, you are looking for off war making or off the iron hand, which give you cripple or disarm on hit. Or war making is on crit, but once you get 100%, it's basically on hit. And they are both an extra attack. Cripple slows, disarm, disarms, but you mostly just want the attack if you go for flexible combat. My belt has some damage, my boots have some out of phase, and as always on every character that can wear arcane items, it's usually best to get the Undeterred mod on your boots, which is the one that gives silence, confusion and stun immunity, which is the minus, a psionic shield, as I find that to be the best tool, a lantern with some damage and defense, which is maybe what I should have mentioned, despite taking ethereal form, you will need a bit of extra defense on your gear. I got to 93, which is good enough. My ring just has a flat stun immunity on it and a bunch of resists. I ended up rolling this Wheel of Fate that gives a lot of on-hit damage. 31 light, 35 physical. I'm not sure it's better than just a generic ring or crit multi or increased physical, but this looked good enough. My chest armor, yet again, as it is usually the case with ropes, ends up being maybe my best damage item. And then on the daggers, I try to get some accuracy, since I struggled with that. And on this one, I got a on hit or on crit, which is on hit cripple to reduce action speed. There are some other good ones on daggers, but um, this is what I ended up with. From the escorts, you are looking for the usual stuff for arcane weapon users. I picked up lacerating strikes from a thief, which gives me some extra damage through the bleeding, picked up Premonition from a Seer, which helps me with my resistances, at least earlier, when I didn't have as much out of phase. Then you try to pick up Dex or Cunning and get a Chant Fortress if you find a Sun Paladin. For the Elixirs, it's pretty close, but I would still take class points first, then generic points, then the Elixir that gives you 4% physical crit, then the Cunning Dexterity, potion and then I would aim for the elixir of invulnerability if you can still get it at that point. And the play pattern is very simple. You use shadow grasp every time at the beginning until you get out of phase. Then you use shadow step at the beginning to proc it into your debuffs like dual strike or if it's a weapon class you can go for lunge or simply shadow grasp. Then you expose weakness if the target has a lot of armor or you could possibly miss it with not enough accuracy, and then you flurry and it's going to die. If not, then you snap and flurry again. This basically killed the final bosses, so if they are still alive after this, something is not right. In conclusion, Shadow Blade is exactly what I expected when I put it in C tier on the tier list. It has a fairly weak early game, although Shadow Grasp does a lot of work, but scales to do pretty insane damage later on in the game and has an easy time getting to 70% all resistance. But despite that, even though you even have trained reactions, I felt a little squishier than usual. But maybe that's just the feeling that I get because I almost died. That kind of psychologically damaged my view of Shadowblade's tankiness. Because objectively, with trained reactions and max all resist, you should be pretty good to go. I'm currently trying out the rogue with throwing knives, stealth and poison. And I've not gotten very far, but um, I can tell you stealth is not good, but I'm still trying to make it work. And throwing knives are extremely good. So we'll see how that character develops or if I end up playing a different class if I die. Thank you for watching.